You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. What a beautiful day for horses in the morning. You are listening to the number one horse podcast in the world. Here is your entertaining look at the horse world and the people in it. Good morning, everybody. I am Glenda Geek in Ocala, Florida. And I am Allison Renborg in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And you are listening to the monthly Equine Affair episode of Horses in the Morning on the Horse Radio Network for January 18th. This episode is brought to you by Equine Affair. Good morning, horse world. It's the third Thursday of the month. That means it's time for the Equine Affair episode. North America's premier equine expo and equestrian gathering. Well, welcome back, everybody, to the third Thursday of each month when we have E. Allison and Equine Affair on. On to this Equine Affair episode, we have Mark Belender, who's going to talk to us about competing in the Mountain Trail Challenges. And we have our old friend Daniel Stewart back, and he's going to talk to us about overcoming fears, failure, failures, and frustrations. He did that just to mess me up, I think. That's why, <laughs> speaking of failure. In- intentional. <laughs> yeah. well, speaking of failures. Um, we are potty training my two-year-old. Oh, so that's going well, huh? <laughs> it's going great. We, uh, yeah, for some reason, my dear, wonderful, precious husband, right before we went on vacation, uh, said, you know what? It's been about, you know, it's been a few months since we did the first round one of potty training. Maybe it's time. I Don't you think we should maybe do it like the weekend, uh, the first weekend of the new year? And I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to do. Um, but but he was right. Uh, our daughter. So we tried right after she was two. Did not work. Spectacular failure. Nightmare. The stuff of nightmares. I mean, if any of you guys have potty trained a toddler before. Oh, my. It is like it makes you want to drink. I want a scooter cocktail. Um, you know, a sassy pony. Uh, so that first time was terrible. And then. She's had some time to grow up. She's had some time to connect the dots. And we could tell she was getting ready. Um, So, yeah. So the first weekend of the new year, we dove into potty training. And we're, we're, oh, yeah. Yeah. And we're still doing it. But so, yeah, fears, failures, and frustrations. (laughs) (laughs) That's just, that's the name of my guidebook to potty training. (laughs) You know, there are times I kind of a little bit regret not having kids. And then there's times like this where I don't. Actually, oh, no. man. No. <laughs> I uh, Yesterday, my mother-in-law got peed on and then I got peed on. <laughs> uh, and today my mother is here uh, babysitting for me. And I said, bring some backup pants, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Fun. <laughs> Well, well, welcome back to Potty Talk here. Uh, It seems to be a theme. We've been talking about poop a lot in the last couple of weeks on the show. Yes, the great manure of, what, 1848 or whatever? I did that just to annoy the listeners. So so this is the great... Poop and pee of 2024. <laughs> Stay tuned, guys. Well, you only have a couple of months to get this figured out because uh, I cannot believe I got an email from Equine Network saying, oh, we're going to do the booth again like we did last time, the recording booth. And I said, I think so. So because I'm planning on coming, but I can't believe oh, we're planning on Ohio already. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was uh, in the couple of weeks before Christmas, you know, everybody starts tuning out on their business email. But like I'm tuning in like I was working really, really hard up until Christmas, trying to get stuff in motion, our whole staff was, for Ohio, um, so that when I came back from the break, um, we could hit the ground running. And sure enough, we have. So, like, it's been, things are coming together really, really fast. We've got lots of great people booked. We're putting a schedule together, which I already have people (laughs) harassing me on Facebook. Where's the schedule? (laughs) We're working on it, okay? So, as as far ahead as it is, you guys are eager to go, and that's what makes it exciting. So, And this yep. is, uh, remind everybody where this one is. Yeah, so uh, our spring equine affair is at the Ohio Expo Center in Columbus, and it is April 11 through 14, 2024. Very good. And then, of course, that's always a couple of weeks before uh, Land Rover in Kentucky. Yes. 
So yes. a lot of people do both. I know a lot of people that you know do both of those. So I, uh, it'll be interesting to see if we meet some of those people. And I'm excited to come back to Ohio again. Yeah, we're. I'm. I'm really happy. This is the first time we've actually gotten to like talk about it. So yes. I'm excited you're coming. <laughs> yes, yes, I am. I put it in for my travel schedule, and they contacted me already. So I'll be there. We'll set up. We'll, we'll have. If you have time, we'll do some more shows there. Yeah, we'll 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 plan on it. Sounds That'll good. Be so fun. Yeah. All right. Well, you want to get to our first guest? Let's do it. So our first guest hails from Silver Creek, Washington. If you love extreme trail, mountain trail, or trail challenges, you probably already know the name Mark Belinder. And if you don't, ears up. Mark Belinder founded the International Mountain Trail Challenge Association, along with his beautiful wife, Lee, in order to promote the sport of mountain trail. He has won several national titles. He's written articles and books. He's produced multiple DVDs. He knows it all. He also designs and builds mountain trail courses, which I think is pretty cool. He presented with us in Massachusetts last fall, and he'll be coming to Ohio this spring. So we thought he'd make a perfect guest for this month's episode. So let's welcome Mark to the show. Well, hi, Mark. Good morning. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, and good morning to you. Where are you? You're driving. Where are you heading off to today? Well, actually, I get to, um, I have a very interesting life, but today I get my hair cut because I look like Einstein <laughs> right now. <laughs> and <laughs> literally, <laughs> oh, goodness. And then I have to go get uh, new glasses. My eyes are getting older and tired. And then I have <laughs> to go to a building department and uh, pick up a permit for a uh, uh, big commercial project I'm building. So and real life. <laughs> real life. Yeah, real life. You know, when you're a general contractor, you're always building something somewhere. Yeah. So, Let's talk about that for a minute. So you're a general contractor on like, so you build more than just mountain trail courses. <laughs> yes, we build more than mountain trail courses. We're actually, we do primarily steel. We're doing stuff up to about 430 foot three spans. You can put a couple 747 side by side or make a nice big horse arena or make a factory, whatever you want. Uh, I don't do very many houses, but I'm building one right now for a friend. Um, we're kind of all over the board in what we build, and, and I've done a lot of sawmills, three big ones actually down in California, and added on to a bunch of them up here. And, and so building the mountain trail courses fits right in because we can just simply build them on site at the shop with the crew and then put them on a semi and ship them. I just got my importer's license into Canada, and Ooh. so we just shipped our first mountain trail course to Halifax. Uh, here a couple of weeks ago, and then in May or June, I'll fly up there and, and complete the process. It's a little bit interesting to get to get set up as a manufacturer, so you can actually go to Canada and um, work or put them together. It's uh, you can't just go to Canada and work. I get up there as an architect landscaper, but now I can get up as an importer and and uh, evaluate the products that we send there and make sure they're properly assembled, etc. Uh, and laid out in a manner that will they can host IMTCA certified shows. Well, cool. So yeah. yeah, yeah. So we're always building something somewhere on this planet. <laughs> well, yeah, and I, I was gonna say so. I I got the pleasure of driving you and Lee to the airport uh, in Massachusetts when you were on your way home, and I think we talked about. Have you guys been to South America? No, Israel. You built a course in Israel, right? Yeah, we, we got back from Israel right before the wheels came off the bus. Yeah. Um, a, lot of, a lot of friends over there. It's a big horse community. Um, yeah. A lot of, a lot of well-bred horses, a lot of um, nice rainers, et cetera. What's really exciting, the government or the association, which is part of the government that brought us over – IMTCA or mountain trail kind of brings all the breeds together and there's quite mm -hmm. a few Arabs, Arabians over there uh, and quarter horses and the association, you know, has a lot of the Arab uh, speaking people in it and the, the Jewish people in it because there's one town that's all Arab and right next to it, it's a little Jewish town and followed by it and they're all mixed together and, and the mountain trail tends to not be in uh, you know it's 
it brings everyone together. It's not breed specific. I don't need rainers. I don't need jumpers, dressage, Arabs, or Tennessee walkers or anything else. Any breed works. And so it's really been nice to see this bring people together. And we yeah. see that in the States and wherever we go, that it's, um, you know, what people can come together, maybe they won't shoot at each other. Right. Well, and that's what I, I was reading up on the association and I was just so impressed with mountain trail is not discipline specific. You can ride any tech, any breed, gated mule, whatever, right? This is something that <laughs> yes, anybody can. can do. Yes. I was judging the nationals over in Italy and the FEI was with me, spent four days with me to see if this would work and if it would be truly a discipline, equine discipline. In one of the classes, I had 40 some riders. I had 21 different uh, breeds, one meal. I had stock seat, Spanish, Western, and English riders all in one single class, which is pretty cool, huh? That is cool. That's a nice cross section of the industry right there. <laughs> yeah. yeah you, you can't get any better than that, you know. So, yeah. yes, it, it is a neat discipline to bring everyone together. And and I was looking at pictures. You can do mountain trail in hand as well as ridden. Is that right? Uh, mountain tra- in hand is huge. Um, it's huge. There's a lot of people that maybe are to the point where riding, they're a little nervous. And for these young horses, how nice for them to get used to maybe a swinging bridge or a rolling bridge. And uh, instead of uh, being scared when people ride in, the biggest thing, the biggest reason I like to see them start it in hand is because I take the heartbeat of the human away. And Mm -hmm. If that horse can feel you and you're nervous, guess what? They're going to be nervous too because if something up on top and you're their leader and they can feel your heartbeat and you're scared, then the wheels come off the bus. If I can get rid of that heartbeat, you know, we can get any horse, any place in the globe, doesn't make, doesn't matter what make, model, or age, or disposition. It'll take about one hour to get a horse comfortable in, in a quiet, bold, confident manner to go over the swinging bridge, the rolling bridge, go through water, go through the squirting water box, do the step downs, do the fans, do the swinging bridge and the teeter totter all within one hour, hour if it's properly taught. If I have a rider that is new to it and they're scared, it's going to take you weeks to accomplish the same amount of um, dis- or the same amount of training. Yeah. Yeah, just because the rider's adding their nervousness to the situation, right? Exactly. Yes, yeah. exactly. So so let's talk a little bit about mountain trail. Like it is it is so different from trail class. <laughs> right? Like what is mountain trail? You mentioned all these crazy obstacles, the swinging bridge, the rolling bridge, and you had a swinging bridge with us in mass, I think. Can we Yes, talk we did. About yeah. Let's talk a little bit about those different obstacles and what are we trying to achieve in a mountain trail challenge? Well, the whole thing is you're trying to simulate a real trail. And out here in the Pacific Northwest, and I know across the globe, it's pretty much the same, but we have a trail that goes from Canada to Mexico. It's called the Pacific Crest Trail. And some things are not well-maintained. So some of the bridges, they move. They, they're not supposed to move, but they move. Mm-hmm. And I've seen some real disasters and some real wrecks. And the sad thing is when you have a wreck on the Pacific Crest Trail or any place out in the wilderness, it's a long way for help. Yeah. So it becomes very critical that that horse can learn to deal with adversity, deal with something that moves under them without panicking. If you can get that, then the horse can be in the wilderness, a bridge can move. And we have some actually suspension bridge out here uh, in the coast where horses are not trained for them. And so there's some terrible wrecks, sad to say, because 
of poor horsemanship. You shouldn't ever put a horse in a situation if they haven't been trained, but people do it all the time. And so if you simulate on a small scale called a mountain trail course where you have a swinging bridge and other things, then the horses will go out on the trail and it's just another obstacle. And you've already built their boldness and confidence. They're not, you know, scared to death. It's really, it's really fun. It sounds fun. I mean, it sounds like if your ultimate goal was, I want to get out there and ride in the real world, that mountain trail would be how you would start. <laughs> like you oh would, my goodness. You would start there. I mean, obviously you'd start with good horsemanship and all the things, but then the next step would be let's compete in mountain trail. And then we can go ride in the real world. Cause my horse has, has already faced a lot of scary looking things and done well. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You're trying to, <clears throat> excuse me, you're trying to build that boldness and that confidence in the horse. Um, and <laughs> let me tell you, the, the one obstacle, which is one of my favorites, is what we call the squirting water box. So it has a floating top and the top has holes in it. So when that horse steps on it, water squirts up to its belly. That sounds terrifying just for me. Like, <laughs> and, Well, there's a lot of horses that object to my engineering. Trust me. Yeah, yes. But when they learn that they can deal with something like that, and when I'm training a horse, I really don't care what that horse thinks. I don't care what my client thinks. I don't care if they're scared to death. That is not my role to care about what the horse thinks. My role is to transfer knowledge and to take that horse and that rider where they can go. Mm -hmm. And in that sometime is tough, tough for them. And the horses don't always agree. But when everything is accomplished, you can see the pride of that horse and you can see the pride and the confidence also of the rider, you know, that I did it getting there sometimes it's not a pleasant experience. I acknowledge that, but it is what it is. But my focus is what that horse and what that rider can do, not what they can't do. And often all we're talking about is a T. You know, get rid of the T out of can't and you put it into a can and you'd be amazed how far those riders can go and how far the horses can go. And the more sensitive of the horse, the easier it is to train, believe it or not. <clears throat> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the Arabs have been the quickest to learn the obstacles. Um, yeah. But they don't, they're always a little bit leery sometimes. <laughs> and it seems like we always have some Arabs in training and they're just as cute as can be. They're very lucky, uh, <laughs> I bet. Yeah, very <laughs> lucky. And, yeah. Yeah. The nice and part about the Arabs, war. though, is once they learn it, they'll do it a hundred times in a row. You know, they're they're yes, going exactly. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. going. Yeah. yeah, we just sent back to Arabs that they were here as little babies to just kind of get started and handled, and then they came back, and boy, they grew up in front of our eyes and. Yeah, they're going through the water boxes and the cross bucks and you name it, stepping down into water. And water is a huge issue for a lot of people and a lot of horses. Mm -hmm. um, they go on a trail ride and they come to a stream or whatever, and it's a, just a disaster. You know, mm -hmm. The horse jumps, the person ends up in the water or they're injured or something like that. It's amazing how we never have time to train, but we always have time to go ride. Mm. And so if that horse has been taught how to go in water, not made to go in the water, taught how to deal with it, it's forever their whole life, then they're okay. And the younger you teach them, the better. Yes. Yes. Well, and, and kind of speaking of teaching and training, uh, we were thrilled to have you in Massachusetts last fall, and you're going to be with us in Ohio this spring and you're going to be bringing mountain trail. Tell us a little bit about what you have planned. And, and I think you'll be having riders again, right? Uh, people who can participate in your clinics. But Oh yeah. That's always fun. Yeah. Well, it depends on what they give me. Um, fortunately, my wife can help, which makes a huge difference where we can kind of split the time and keep yeah. everyone going. And usually they give me from four to nine horses. 
And sometimes it's more of a circus than others, but it's always fun. So in that hour and a half time, our goal is to have those riders recognize that the horse can actually walk across the balance beam or a swinging bridge or a teeter-totter in a very short time. The first thing that we start with, and I think you probably witnessed that, we do not start with the obstacle. We Thank actually goodness. start, yeah, <laughs> we start with the mind. And yeah. we have become so enamored with pressure and release and sticks and strings that we've wasted their time because we forgot the horse actually has a mind. And so once we get into the mind, and there are certain instincts that we can trigger, and most of the horse's life runs on instinct. You will never beat instinct as a human. Instinct is something different that God gave the animal and the insect kingdom that he did not give to humans. It's one that we scientifically cannot explain to this day how it works. And I can talk about migrating butterflies, the monarchs, the painted ones in Europe, you know, three to 4,000 miles, the painted ones, 10,000 miles. Those little dragonflies you see around the pond, they migrate 13,000 miles. I can talk about fish and bears and geese, you name it. We don't understand how that works, but we can't deny it because we see it in the world around us. So in the horse's world, there's certain hardwired instincts. And one of the hardwired instincts is they must please what they perceive to be above them in their herd. In their world, there's no equals. They have a pecking order. We all know about that uh, to the point where if you scatter hay out in the pasture, horse number three can go eat number four's hay. Number four goes eat five hay. But horse number three does not go eat number two's hay or all heck breaks loose, correct? <laughs> yes. So if I can teach these people how to back that horse up, which we do right off without ever looking at that horse, that horse will, that will trigger an instinct in that horse's mind that you are above. And the size of the person, the size of the horse has nothing to do with their pecking order. It's their intensity and often an alpha mare, which will lead the herd, will be the smartest, not the biggest, not the baddest, but the smartest. And they dominate and they lead. And so in that horse's mind, if it backs up for you, you now have moved above. That will trigger that instinct, I have to try to please. That's going to take away about 80% of all of your issues on the obstacles. Because right off, the horse instinct says, I got to please. That instinct to please will actually override the fear of the unknown instinct, which is fascinating. And so you can watch these horses try their hearts out, but it puts a lot of burden on you then to take care of them. Yeah, but it's really, gotta, I, I find it fascinating. Yeah. You've got to be a good leader now because you, you've said I lead. Uh, and now you have to be the good leader. <laughs> so you have to be the good be, leader and, yeah. and consistent. They will, yes. they will find every opening that you have in some horses to find that weakness is much stronger than others. Some of them you cannot blink. Mm -hmm. And others are a lot more, okay, you're a leader now. Let's take it from there. I'm happy. <laughs> we all love those types. Yes. And so so if you you back your horse up, you have established I am leader, horse is gonna follow me. So then what's that next step to getting them to the obstacle? Do you have people lead the horse across the bridge first or no, I don't no. lead the horses. Uh, they will follow, mm -hmm. but that doesn't teach them. Mm -hmm. So then you, you're always going to have to lead them. It's kind of like a person uh, that you train for a certain job. If you always, you know, take them, you always have to. If you always micromanage that person, you're always going to have to micromanage. If you say you give the parameters, this is the job that you are to do, certain ways you do it, I really don't care. I just need this job done. For instance, when we put up buildings, you know, some of the beams are huge. Some of them take multiple cranes just to lift one beam. 
okay, I know from a safety standpoint, and I know what we have to do, but certain things don't have to be identical, done identically the same way. Now, if someone has a better mousetrap or they're flying the steel, what we call it, God bless you. It doesn't have to be just my way as long as we get it done within this perimeter and everyone's safe. Mm-hmm. Um, so these horses, if you always lead them, you will always have to lead them. And that's not that's one of the big differences between dressage and reining. In reining, we say to the horse, I'm going to teach you how to turn around and spin, and now I'm going to put the burden back on you. In dressage, the pirouette, we're going to constantly micromanage the pirouette constantly. But and that's the big difference between dressage and reining. Reining, we're going to run you on a loose rein. You're going to grow up. You're going to learn your job. Dressage, we're there. We're, you know, it's just it's a subtle difference, but it's it's uh, pretty big. So these horses, if you say now you have to address the water box by yourself, it's going to be tough. You have to address the water. Pretty soon, each obstacle becomes easier and easier and easier for them to address. Because they've already built their confidence of success. The, and it's just like a human. Once a human learns that, oh, I can do this, I was successful, then their next assignment, they approach it in a much bolder fashion. Instead of wasting their time going what ifs, they can go, I can do this. And so you, you see a big change in the horse when you say you have to face your own fears. I'm not going to face them for you. I love that. So it's a little bit about de- treating the horse not as an equal per se, but as you you did this, you can do this. I'm here with you to get you through it. But like, this is how you accomplish this task. Now you go do it. It's not right. A, yeah. Put your foot here and then your other foot here. And then this is, you know, I'm in charge every step. It's, you know, we learn together. We're going together. You handle your mm-hmm. side. I handle my side. Right. I, you know, I tell people, you know, I'm not superior to a horse. I'm not inferior to a horse. I just hear different drums and march to a different tune. That doesn't make (laughs) me inferior or superior. You know, God said he gave us dominion over the animals, but he never said Jack Tiddley about making us superior to them. (laughs) We cannot live where they live. (laughs) Right. I can see around the corner and they can't. So it actually makes a really good partnership. But, you know, one thing that I have to laugh about is the long balance beam. And the long balance beam, they're about 30 feet long. And some of them are higher than others. And when you ride a horse across them, you can't look down. Because if you look down, the horse steps off (laughs) and you're out of balance. That's where the partnership comes is, okay, I'm going to do my job. I'm going to look forward. I'm going to stay in balance. And you do your job. Stay on the darn balance beam so we don't both die. You know, and those horses, they grow up very fast. And they're very proud of doing their job. It's it's fascinating. But what's interesting is another one of my six professions, I'm also a teacher. I don't know if you knew that. Right. Okay. So periodically... I've taught economics at the college. But can you imagine if I'm teaching 530 economics and you're going for your master's degree and you must go through my class, period. In the first day you walk in my class, Alice, and I say, can you go to the chalkboard and show me you can do your timetables to 10? And you're thinking, this is a graduate course. What's this guy doing? But you know, my reputation's a jerk. So you go do it. The second day, I say, Allison, can you go to the board and show me you can do your timetables to 10? You're going to be pretty insulted and is trying to figure out what kind of idiot did they hire. Now, the third day, you're more than likely going to blow your top when I ask you to do that. You're probably going to yell at me or storm out and go to the dean and say, what kind of idiot did you hire for 530 economics? This is what he just asked me to do. Yet, That's very, we find that insulting, yet that's what we do to our horses every day. Oh, you're so right. We get on them. We get on. Do you remember this? Let's make sure you know how to bend and everything else. That can make a pretty cranky horse, especially a mare. Mare, we negotiate. It's kind of like being married, you know. The gildings, you kind of kick in the butt and say, now, come on, let's get your tail in gear. Let's do this. The mares, you negotiate. But we do that every day. We find if you get on that horse, and you expect it to be right where you left it, 
and you start in. Now, if you have an issue, then you can go back just like teaching, figure out, figure out, okay, what hole did I leave out? What did I not communicate to? You're going to have a lot of happy horses and you're not going to have a bunch of frustrated horses with ear pinning, switching the tail, tightness in the muzzle, sweat, everything else. We don't get very many sweaty horses at all. Most of the sweat comes from um, uh, from the mind, not the body. Oh, here's something really fascinating. So when we start on the obstacles, if you notice they're at equine affair, I didn't worry about doing anything from the right side. I only do one exercise from the right side, um, move away from me. Mm-hmm. Well, it turned out about nine years ago, a study came out of the UK that um, University of um, or Colorado, CSU, Colorado State University shared with me, came out of the UK. A horse can't read you out of its right eye. Its left eye grows stronger over time. So we said, OK, let's take this study and see if we can put it into a practical application. So we took 57 horses that had never been started. For the first 30 days, it's all groundwork. They learn to go over the obstacles, turn around on the obstacles with their eyes closed. We learn to long line drive them, pony them. There's only one exercise we do on the right side, and that's build our bubble. We noticed that the horses were learning at a little over twice the pace, but they were showing much less signs of stress, such as pinning of the ears, tightness of the eyes, tightness of the muzzle, swishing of the tail, less sweat, and a lower heartbeat, all signs of stress. And we found that just fascinating. After the 30 days, we went to the right side. It was as if we'd always been there. So our conclusion from that study was when the horse is trying to learn something new, they're trying to read you, but when you're on the right side, they can't read you. So they're stressed out of their mind, trying to learn something new and stressed because they can't read you. But if you stay on their left side, they can read you. And it's voila, it's the craziest thing you've ever seen. That is, that's, yeah, it, I love yeah. that. Well, we're, we're out of time, but thank you so much, Mark, for coming on. And listeners, you guys definitely want to catch his clinics at Equine Affair in Ohio. I am delighted that both Mark and, well, Lee will be with you, right? Yeah, Lee, Lee has helped yes. me for sure. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. So you can meet both the Belenders, the magnificent Belenders at Equine Affair in Ohio, April 11th through 14th. So thank you so much, Mark. This has been really fascinating. Thank you guys so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Awesome. You too. Bye. Well, Equine Affair in Ohio is celebrating 30 years of horses, and you're invited. Join us for four fabulous days of all things horses on April 11th through the 14th, 2024, at the Ohio Expo Center in Columbus, Ohio. We'll have clinics presented by the guests in this episode, as well as Mike Major, Ken McNabb, Pat Pirelli, Steve Landvit, uh, Chelsea, is, is it Kennedy? Kennedy, yep. Yeah, Philip Dutton, uh, Cynthia Hankins, and many more, plus a sprawling trade show, which we'll be in, and a breed pavilion, horse and farm exhibits, a, and the Great Equestrian Fitness Challenge, fun giveaways, and lots more great stuff. And we, we'll be doing shows from there, too. And we'll probably have a listener meetup for everybody. We did that last time. It was a lot of fun. And did we mention Fantasia, Equine Affairs Musical Celebration of the Horse, sponsored by Equine Medical and Surgical Associates, will return on Thursday, Friday. Friday and Saturday nights of the event. Separate tickets are required for Fantasia. Get your tickets for Equine Affair and Fantasia at equineaffair.com today. And hopefully I don't get sick this year and I can actually go to it. So Yes. So. <laughs> You were so sick last year. And it it happened on that Saturday when I was supposed to go to Fantasia. I know. But I would have made half the place sick. I was pretty sick. Yes, you were. You got me sick. Yes. (laughs) And then you got it after. But hopefully this year I can get to Fantasia. So save me a ticket, all right? We will. Well, coming up next is an old friend of the show. He's been coming on our shows for probably 10 or 12 years. Uh, I love him to death. His name is Daniel Stewart. Uh, He is a, uh, well, he's had 25 years as an international 
professional coach and clinician with a degree in physical education. And he's created a bunch of equestrian clinics, lectures, and training camps. But he really does focus on sports psychology, athletics, and the performance end of things. He has uh, He's an author of a book called Pressure Proof, Ride Right, Fit and Focused. He has a whole bunch of books, uh, Bolder, Braver, Brighter. You all know him. He's been on, the show, on almost all of our shows many times. And today, we're having him on to talk about overcoming fears, failures, and frustrations. And if you have never had a chance to attend one of his clinics or his talks, you need to do that. So when you're in Ohio, definitely schedule time to see Daniel. It is well worth it because we all have these issue, mental issues when we're dealing with riding, in my case, driving, just dealing with horses in general. And he's the one to help you out. Hey, my friend, Daniel, thank you for joining us today. Hey, it's been great. I miss hearing from you. Thanks for bringing me back. Listeners, Daniel uh, first came on our show, on the Stable Scoop show, back in 2010. So we've been 14 years hanging around each other and occasionally doing interviews and just having some fun. So welcome back. Thank you very much. We're old friends, not because we've known each other a long time, but because we're both getting old. Because we're old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but look at it this way. We have both made it 14 years doing this business. So... That's wow, good. good yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're older than I am by a few weeks. So um, so you've been doing it longer than I am. Good for you. Congrats. Hey, Daniel, you're heading over to Ohio. I get to see you at uh, Equine Affair. Oh, man, I'm so excited. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Equine Affair. I uh, got to teach there a whole bunch and then, uh, and then haven't been able to get back the last couple of years. So, uh, man, I couldn't be more excited. What kind of things do you do there? What are your sessions involved? What, you know, what, oh, yeah. So I, I, think, I think I'm set up to do um, uh, some equestrian sports psychology seminars, which, um, which are, you know, if, I can, if I'm doing a good job, they're upbeat and humorous and exciting and empowering and you know, positive. So I think we all need a little bit more of that. So I plan on bringing my Kumbaya Disney Channel hat with me <laughs> <laughs> and seeing if I can make things just, yeah, just a, a powerful and empowering. So that'll be some sports psychology seminars. And then I'm a big believer that equestrians are athletes. So I'm going to be teaching some equestrian uh, boot camps, some strength and conditioning courses, uh, you know, little things that we can all take home. I'll even I'll even um, teach everybody how to build a, a fitness center at the barn if that's of interest to them. Mm -hmm. And then I think my favorite part is I'll be doing uh, mounted clinics. Um, now they're I think we're going to be doing jumping clinics, but they're appropriate for everybody from uh, Western pleasure to um, to uh, hunters, jumpers, eventers. Uh, so we're going to do some um, some some mental coaching clinics that focus on helping us to do things like recovering quickly after making mistakes, um, push beyond failure, uh, remember important things under pressure, stay calm instead of, you know, freaking out. Lots of really neat messages, even in the mountain clinic. So we'll have horses in the arena and we'll get to jump around a little tiny bit. But the message um, in everything I do is, um, is just develop the ability to to, you know, to pick um, confidence over nervousness or self-belief over self-doubt. So I'm looking forward to the classes, clinics, and courses I'll be teaching there. Well, I will be happy to come sit in on a sports psychology class. The fitness one, I'm, I'm going to pass. And... <laughs> <laughs> but you need it, Glenn. I know, but that's why I'm passing. Yeah. <laughs> you're getting up there, you know. You're... <laughs> hey, well, let me tell you this, because I bet a lot of our listeners are thinking the same thing. Um, oh, I've got a hip thing or an ankle thing or a knee thing. Or I haven't exercised, you know, in, in a decade. So I'm going to be, the, the fitness program I'm going to be teaching will be for all levels and all ages. You can be in shape or a shape. And a circle's a shape, so bring it on. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> all right. So, so, yeah, yeah. So so please don't have anybody um, believe that, well, I'm out of shape, so I should be attending. No, not at all. I'll show everybody how to modify the exercises for your specific level of, of you know, of, of current fitness. I just, again, I believe we're all athletes at all different parts of our lives. So I'll make sure that I show something for everybody. So, Daniel, today uh, I asked you for a topic because I love getting in the weeds with you on these various things. Because we've all gone through these things, whether it's horses or life, right? And today's topic is fears, failures, and frustrations. And I, I want to say with Daniel, what, and this is, I think, why we've had such good conversations in the past. You talk about, obviously, riders, and you're talking to riders, and you're talking about fears and frustrations and you know dealing with horses and competing and all of that stuff. But all of this applies to, to other life, to your outside horse life. It just applies to life. 
Yeah, yeah. Hey, thanks for hitting on that. Uh, because I think I forget to do that sometimes. I, I, I do believe that we, what we learn inside the box, and the box is that square arena that we work in, isn't it? You know, it's made out of wood, and it's kind of a box or a rectangle. I believe that what we learn inside the arena can help us to become so much better humans outside the arena. And and I know that when I sent my daughter to the barn, she came home a slightly better version of herself. You know, she was more responsible and more timely, willing to get out of bed early to, you know, to do things that meant something to her. She became more coachable. She, my daughter, daughter learned a lot of, of, of positive life lessons at the barn that helped her to become a better human. Um, so, yeah, when we talk about overcoming fears, frustrations, and failures at the barn, you know, man, don't leave it at the barn. Take it home. Take it to your driver's license test that's making you nervous. Take it to your job interview that's making you doubt yourself. Take it to your relationships, your careers. What we learn at the barn makes us better humans. So I think that's an important message. Thanks. Does failure cause fear or fear cause failure or both? Is it possible that maybe the fear of failure mm. is is one of the one of the, the most predominant ex- experiences that most of us everybody bump into? It's from the yes. time we're two, right? And <laughs> right. Yes. And and what a great point. Man, if you if you have a fear of failure, you know, first of all, please don't feel bad about it. You know, oftentimes the fear of failure is bad. Let's just cut cut to the chase but feeling bad because you're feeling bad well that's just not right you know i mean i have a fear of failure uh, uh my wife has a fear of failure glenn i bet you have a fear of failure oh, even though you've never failed life. in your whole life <laughs> <laughs> i still i still think this whole podcasting thing is going to go away so there's that <laughs> oh <laughs> so, but so, it's so true right i mean uh, but but we none of us starts something if we if we had the fear of failure we would never try anything you we all overcome it or we would never do anything oh well see now there's the there's the real key is in it it's is if you can overcome what holds us back you know and we can all we can all plant a seed of doubt from time to time but but uh, we have a choice we can plant it or we can or or we can believe in ourselves and move beyond it so so yeah, yeah. The the the. So there's two kinds of fears. There's a rational fear. You know, let's say that you that your horse spooked in a corner and you went dirt surfing and broke your collarbone. Well, the next time you get on your horse, you might be pumping the brakes a little bit. Dude, that's pretty rational in my opinion. You know, so a rational fear keeps us safe. So when we have an accident. Um, or get injured, or or even a spook that scares us. The brain is gonna is gonna it's gonna it's gonna kind of put an asterisk beside that memory, and it'll let you it'll kind of let you revisit that memory more often than not because the brain has one job: it's to keep us safe. And you know this corner over there it interfered with my perception of safety, so I'm just gonna make you think about that corner. Man, that's a rational fear. Now, if you have those fears, you know, good on you. You're human. Please don't feel bad about that. That's the human survival instinct. But do you know this? There's a way past it. Now, rational fears make sense. The ones that 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 I tend to work with the most are irrational fears. Fears that are not associated with safety or their survival instinct. And, and there you go. Um, fear of failure is the big one, isn't it? A fear of failure does not interfere with the brain's perception of safety. There's the fear of failure, the fear of letting someone down, the fear of not living up to somebody's expectations, the fear of spectators, the fear of judges. Don't get me started. I'll keep talking (laughs) because there are no lack of irrational fears. So rational fears, we get it and we can fix it. Good news is irrational fears, we all get them. And we can't fix them. Uh, and again, that will be that will be my goal uh, at Equine Affair this year is to help everybody who suffers from rational and or irrational fears find the other end of them. Are there people that just can't get over it? That are irrational fear. So, so interesting question. Um, Post traumatic instances often, oftentimes create the perception of impossibility. You know, the idea of I've experiencing I've experienced something so traumatic that I, I don't believe I'll see the other end of it. I bet you I've worked with over a hundred people who had that um, that perception, and they're all over it. You know, and don't get me wrong, it's not because of me. It, it, we know how the brain works. We get it. And if we can teach, if we can teach within the brain's parameters, um, then we can get to the other end of almost everything. All right. I, I, I really, truly believe that. And, and the good news is it's not complex. Some of the tricks and, 
and, and tips that I have are are ridiculously simple that can create just phenomenally massive, productive, empowering changes. So, um, yeah, I don't I don't believe there are many things that we cannot. If we work hard and work with somebody perhaps like you or I that can can help us to see the other end. Of, oh, can see the dark, uh, see the, the silver lining from the dark cloud. How's that? <laughs> Another old joke. I, I like how you will that. Yeah, way. I just threw up in my mouth yeah. a little bit when I said that. Sorry. <laughs> so, so we've been doing this, both of us have been doing this a very long time. Um, and we've seen the world change. Has fear changed? And what I mean by that is, as we've seen new generations come up, are their fears any different than the previous generations of riders? Um, or are people people and they're always the same? People are people and we're always changing. We're always evolving. Um, and in our environment, in, in you know, the whole nature and nurture, when the environment changes, our fears change. You know, and, and it's interesting, when you and I started to work together in 2010, I believe that, let's take the young rider um, uh, uh, demographic, for example, in 2010, I think that they experienced rational fears, like a fear of getting hurt. I think they experienced rational fears, like a fear of letting someone down, because when my dad spent a lot of money on this horse, I hope I don't let them down. Those fears haven't changed. But but through the introduction of things like social media, right, the new fear of not being enough, you mm -hmm. know, wishing I was had longer legs or curlier hair or, or whiter teeth. So this Instagram filtered era that we're currently living in, um, I do believe that it 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 influences the amount of social fears we bring to the barn. Like, will I fit in? Will I be good enough? Do I look like everyone else? Um, I do notice that a lot of the irrational fears that we're experiencing look a whole lot different than they did when I started uh, when I started teaching these clinics, you know, 20 years ago. Is that a harder one to overcome because the peer pressure, you know, it's really what it is, right? The peer pressure through social media is so ingrained. It's, per it's pervasive. It's not, it's not hard to overcome. No, okay. no, we just need a couple of tools. There's a, um, there's a key. The door, the door seems pretty closed. There's the key. Uh, I'll give you a key. Um, if the key doesn't work, there's a window. You can crawl through that. <laughs> you know? um, so, so their fears, man, fears are what they are, aren't they? They, they feel, they feel too big. They feel like walls. They feel too big and, and, and nothing we can do can get us over that wall. But I believe that, that, that mental coaching just, I mean, it's just a ladder, you know, the walls get bigger. Let's give, give ourselves some bigger tips. And again, I'll, I'll bump into a bunch of those tips at Equine Affair. And I, and I know that my audience, someone in the audience, no, everyone in the audience is going to shake their head at a different time. I'll teach them five little tips and, and I'll look out there and I'll teach this quick little tip and ooh, the head will shake. And I'm like, ooh, that person just got a ladder. So, yeah. We, we still have listeners to talk about. Years ago, we talked about your idea of a song in the warm-up ring. You know, come up with your own song and sing a song. We still have listeners talking about that and still have them talking about what songs they sing. Well, it's it's not just what's – and it's the interesting part, and I think that's wonderful that they're still talking about it, but, but it's not the actual song. Now, it's important for us to understand music is what's called a mood modifier. Right. If you wake up and you're bored and you hear a pump-up song, it, 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 it changes our chemistry. It releases a little bit of, you know, a little serotonin, a little dopamine or whatever it releases. It helps us to modify our moods. Music can pump us up or calm us down. But my instructions have always been, don't just pick any song. Pick songs that have positive affirmation sentences in the lyrics. For them. Because for them, everybody's right? is different, like, right? Well, maybe you need to be calmed down. So maybe the songs, you know, have these calm down messages. Maybe you need to pump up believe in yourself. So then the, uh, the, 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 the positive affirmations speak more towards pumping yourself up and believing in yourself. And the reason those songs work, they're called athletic anthems. The reason they work is because songs get stuck in our head. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I've always said build a pre-ride ritual playlist of music that creates the emotions you want pump up calm down but the songs need to have positive lyrics so that when they get stuck in your head you're walking around the the, the showgrounds going these are the moments i'll remember the most i'll be strong i'll keep pushing on which is the song the climb by hannah montana it's just a brilliant <laughs> song it pumps me up but it's got a brilliant message in it that gets stuck in my head it's a mood modifier Let's talk about frustration. I mean, we all have them, right? Every day. <laughs> we, we all get frustrated. <laughs> so, some people are better at 
you know, brushing them aside, putting them in the wastebasket and moving on. Other people, you know, other people, the personality is just there. That fresh, that's going to live with them for months or however, forever, you know. How do you overcome that one when I think part of how how long you hung, hang on to frustrations is your personality type? Mm. Um, but you can train yourself, I assume, to be one of those that puts in the waste can after 10 minutes and moves on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You 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 bet. And and you're right. I've always thought that 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 we're like fingerprints. We're all wickedly unique in our own way. We're all wonderful in our own different ways. We're all a little bit bent and broken in our ways too. So so fears and frustrations, they're definitely going to be part of our experience. But our ability to our ability to a recognize it, right? It's really important for us to be mindful. This is me feeling frustrated. Um, understand, frustration is always built on a past experience. Frustration does not live in the present moment. So when we're frustrated, we're we have the perception that that something in the past held us back, or the perception that something in the future will hold us back. Obviously, our goal is to plant ourselves in the in the present moment. Um, do you want to know a really cool trick on how to do that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's a really cool trick. And and it comes with a, 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 a pretty brilliant, fun little story. And and please know that, that fears, frustrations, and failures can all be fixed by this one thing. All right? Now, one thing is what I like to call a mojo mantra. Because fears, frustrations, and failures, they make us lose our mojo. And we want to get our mojo back because we love the experience of riding. Now, there's a trick that can help us to get our mojo back, and, and that trick is called a mojo mantra. Now, we all probably know somebody that does mindfulness or yoga or meditation, and when we do those practices, we're encouraged to repeat a mantra to ourselves. And the reason is, is when we repeat a series of words or sounds in a rhythmical way, it stimulates the calmness center in our brain. So isn't that cool? Mantras can stimulate the calmness center in our brain when we're feeling a little tense. But a mojo mantra takes it another step. The words that we say to ourselves in the mojo mantra are directed towards how we want to behave or feel. So here are some mojo mantras. Push on, finish strong. Push on, finish strong. I can do it. Nothing to it. I can do it. Nothing to it. Rest of the ride, best of the ride. Rest of the ride, best of the ride. So this is how I use a mojo mantra when I get frustrated. I jump a fence perfectly. My horse hangs a heel and he pulls the rail anyways. Oh, I'm frustrated. I don't want to feel frustrated because I know it influences my, my experience and my potential. So I get rid of it by repeating a mojo mantra myself when I land. The rail comes down and I repeat, push on, finish strong, push on, finish strong. Make the rest of the ride, best of the ride, rest of the ride, best of the ride. So what's happening here is the mojo mantra, when repeated with rhythm and rhyme, stimulates the calmness center in the brain, but the words tell me what to do. It literally gives me a, a, a one of our presidents said, when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. That mojo mantra, man, it helps me to just hang on. So most mojo mantras are directed towards creating behaviors like push on, finish strong. But I think my favorite mojo mantras don't just help us to develop a behavior, but an emotion like joy or happiness. Here's a brilliant example. Um, at the American Invention Championships earlier this year, a young rider came up to me saying, Coach, I'm so scared. She was in tears. I'm so scared. I had an accident going through water, and I'm in Kentucky, and I need to go through the head of the water today in my competition, and I'm so scared of water because of the accident. I said, I want you to do me a favor and use a mojo mantra. And I said, the, well, here's a fun mojo mantra. When you go through the water, I want you to say these words to yourself. Fish are friends, not food. Fish are friends, <laughs> not food. Because she's like 15 <laughs> years old, right? And I thought that was kind of cute. And that brings Nemo. And, and it, you know what it did? It, it helped her to take things less seriously. So I said, people are going to try and teach you to journal and goal set. And just do me a favor. Just come up with a fun little quirky mojo mantra about water today. So guys, this is what I did. I knew her ride time. I ran over to head of the lake and I'm watching her. She comes over the, the hill. I hear her. She's like, fish are friends, not food. Fish are friends, not food. But then get, get this, guys. I hear her. She jumps into the water and then she changes. And she's like, just bubbles, no troubles. Just bubbles, no troubles. Just bubbles, no troubles. Out of the water, she goes. She canters across the field and she's back to fish are friends, not food. <laughs> Oh. Guys, she came up to me an hour later, almost in tears again, 
this time tears of joy. Guys, she was so sad because she was frustrated and fearful. She couldn't find the other end of it. All she needed was a little mojo mantra that, that was rooted in humor, right? And that helped her to reestablish the connection to the emotions of joy and exuberance and humor rather than fears and frustrations. And Boy, failures. and there we're going to end on what we started with. That applies to anything you do in life. You could have that, whether you're writing or going public speaking or whatever you're doing that you're fearful or you know frustrated about. I think I taught her a message that she's going to, she'll remember the rest of her life. Yep. And when we get yeah. together at Equine Affair, I'll tell you a couple of stories that prove these can last a lifetime. I do think that I taught her something that, that will help her when she's writing her SAT exams, will help her when she gets her driver's license test. I think that I, I think riding, not me, riding taught her something that will make her just a slightly better version of the human that she already is. And you did it in a way, yeah, journaling and all that stuff's great, but that's a long-term fix. Right, right, right. You had this short-term solution to her problem that day. Absolutely. You know, and that's, that, that's a difference. Age, you know, age specific. Oftentimes, if you ask a young writer, you know, 12 year old to journal, that's, that might be one degree of separation. You know, don't get me wrong. I believe it's a, it's a brilliant idea, but I do believe that we need to, we need to take into consideration the audience that we're teaching mental coaching to and give them age specific exercises that I believe can probably help set them up. And once they believe in the power of mental coaching, then you can tell them to sit down and open a notebook. Very good. Thank you, Daniel. And we'll look forward to seeing you. Now, you have a bunch of books, Pressure Proof, Ride Right, Fit and Focused, Bolder, Braver, Brighter. For I don't know what you've been doing in your free time, but you have all those <laughs> books people can get. What, what's your website, too? Oh, uh, the web, website is pressureproofacademy.com. You can yeah, find Daniel yeah. there, and you can also visit with him at Equine Affair in Ohio. Thanks, my friend. Can't wait. Hey, it was brilliant reconnecting. Thanks, buddy. If you'd like to get involved with Equine Affair, we've got good news for you. Save the date for February 15th, 2024. That's when applications to ride with a pro, that means to ride in our clinics, and to compete in the versatile horse and rider competition are due. Materials for ride with a pro along with a clinic schedule will be available online later this month. Application materials for the versatile horse and rider competition are already available online at equineaffair.com. So, you know, if you want to win some money or bragging rights or fun prizes, you should apply to compete for that. And if you'd like to volunteer at the event, you have until February 26th to apply. Volunteers can earn free admission and souvenirs, plus you get a sneak peek behind the scenes. What could be better? Check out our website for more details or check the links in the show notes. We'll put them there. Well, that was a great interview, and I learned a lot about overcoming fears, failures, and frustrations, and and hopefully I can apply some of that to potty training. <laughs> you need to get your daughter to listen to this. That's the question. Yeah. That's the key. Just have her That's... sit down and listen. Listen to Daniel. <laughs> yeah, listen to Daniel while you're – because we sometimes we give her the iPad while she's on the potty because, you know, to get her to sit still. So, like, I'll just say, here, here's some inspirational listening <laughs> There you Daniel. go. Perfect. <laughs> If only Daniel knew. <laughs> well, you can learn more about uh, Equine Affair at the website, equineaffair.com. You can find all the details about booking hotels and travel and parking and just everything. Tickets, all of that stuff is there. Also on the Facebook page or their YouTube channel. They have an active YouTube channel as well, which Allison also helps out with. Uh, and, of course, you can fi follow Horses in the Morning. You can follow us on Facebook. Uh, you can go to horsesinthemorning.com for all the past episodes. Plus, we will be back tomorrow, uh, and we'll have a brand new really bad ads for you. So get your ads in to jennifer at horseradionetwork.com. Thanks, Allison. Thank you. And bad, really bad ads are my favorite, so I'm excited. All right. We will see you guys at Equine Affair. Equine Affair.